The Hidden Forces Driving Bitcoin's Price, a global macroeconomic framework for understanding what moves the price of Bitcoin. Welcome to the Bitcoin Layer. I'm Nick Batia. Every Monday, we deliver Mean, Median, Mode, our weekly risk report to our TBL Pro members. Go subscribe today at thebitcoinlayer.com slash subscribe. Today's video will teach you how to understand what are the global macro factors driving Bitcoin's price up and down. At the Bitcoin Layer, we believe that over a long time horizon, Bitcoin will appreciate significantly in value due to global adoption factors. However, in the short term, Bitcoin is much more controlled by global macroeconomic factors such as the economy, the Federal Reserve, interest rates, stocks, and much more. Today, I want to unpack all that goes on in global macro as well as some of the on-chain native factors that influence Bitcoin as well to try to give you guys an understanding of what are the short and medium term forces on Bitcoin's price. We start with relative returns. In this chart, we have four different asset classes, Bitcoin, stocks, gold, and US treasuries. We compare these four asset classes because it gives us a sense of how Bitcoin is performing versus the other types of investments available to investors. Now, this is only a 12 month chart and it rebases every single asset for to a value of 100 starting 12 months ago. So what you see here is all of these four lines starting at the level of 100 and then they track for how they have performed, meaning if you had invested $100 in each one of these asset classes, today they would be worth these values and over the last 12 months, this is how that they this is how they have tracked versus one another. Now we see here that US treasuries have appreciated about 6% because $100 12 months ago is worth $106 today. 35% for the S&P, a very strong 46% for gold and 123% for Bitcoin. And remember that the value 223, it means that $100 invested 12 months ago would be worth $223 today. That's a return of 123%. So that is how we are going to orient ourselves for this video. We are going to think of Bitcoin in the context of gold, stocks, and US treasuries. And then we are going to understand how Bitcoin moves in relation to those other cl asset classes. The Bitcoin layer is sponsored by Unchained, the undisputed leader in Bitcoin financial services. Unchained empowers you to take full control of your Bitcoin with collaborative multi-sig vaults in which you own two of three keys and you gain a Bitcoin security partner. You can purchase Bitcoin directly into your cold storage via Unchained's trading desk and eliminate all exchange risks. Unchained also offers the best IRA in the industry where you can convert your existing 401ks or retirement accounts to Unchained all while keeping control of your Bitcoin private keys. Don't pay more in taxes than you have to. Talk to Unchained today. Go to unchained.com slash TBL for $100 off when you sign up. Don't risk your Bitcoin security. Do you have Bitcoin private keys stored on paper? Make sure you convert those keys to titanium with Stampseed. Stampseed has this really cool DIY kit that allows you to hammer in your seed phrase into these small titanium plates that are fire resistant and damage resistant. This kit is designed by titanium metal workers that have been working in stamping metal for over 14 years and your words are deeply stamped, not just a shallow dot. So make sure you check out stampseed.com today and use code TBL for 15% off of your order. All right, now let's get into how we view Bitcoin's price movements. We start with technical analysis because our framework is driven first and foremost by price. 
instead of looking at what's happening with the economy and then trying to deduce what investors are going to do or what they should do and what the Fed is going to do or the Fed should do, we let price guide us first, then we read the news second, we look at the economic data second. The reason we do that is because what we ultimately care about are the levels at which buyers and sellers come into the market, and more specifically for you at home, when you go to allocate in your portfolio, you are trying to achieve the best price possible for you. So we don't offer investment advice. We provide independent investment research. Then it's your job to go and allocate based off of different factors, and we are hoping that this risk report can help guide you when you go to allocate. So we start with technical analysis because price guides us. And when Bitcoin is exhibiting a consolidation or a bull run or a bear run, it's our job to identify where Bitcoin is from a behavioral standpoint. Remember that we don't look at technical analysis just from a pure numerical standpoint. We're thinking about it from a behavioral, emotional standpoint of buyers and sellers. They, through their levels at which they buy and sell, exhibit behavior that we can interpret on the chart. So what are we seeing here on the chart? For Bitcoin, it's a consolidation. We had a great run from late 2023 to early this year on the bullishness of ETF approval. Since March, we've had a seven-month consolidation, Bitcoin trading between 50 and 70,000. Bitcoin continues to be in this consolidation. It also is several months away from our specific wedge resolving. Now, just because we've drawn these lines doesn't mean that this is the end-all be-all of the consolidation range. Really, you can just look at the chart, look at the lows of the range and the highs of the range, and think that Bitcoin is in this sideways chop. And until it resolves, we won't have a good beat on where Bitcoin's price is going. So that's why you see we start with price because... Look, the economy might do something. The Fed might do something. Stocks might do something. In the end, it'll appear on the chart, at it either going down if buyers give up or going up if buyers get excited and they feel that momentum is on their side. In, in the end, when we look at what's happening in global macro, it will, of course, influence the Bitcoin price. But why read the news first when we can look at the price first and read the news second. And that's really the way that we think about things. So now let's talk about global macroeconomics. At the Bitcoin layer, we use a new metric that we call TBL liquidity. Now the word liquidity has a ton of different definitions today in the financial landscape. I wanna mention a couple of them, but then talk about how we view liquidity, which I believe it's a very narrow definition of liquidity, and it's not a very popular definition of liquidity. So what do I mean by it, and what are some of the other ways? Liquidity, generally, I think the most broad way to describe or to define this word is how easy it is to buy or sell an asset. So if we think about a share of Apple versus a $5 million home, which is more liquid? Well, of course, the stock, the share of Apple is more liquid because you can sell it easily versus a $5 million house, it's going to be more difficult to sell. The share, the single share of Apple is going to be obviously much less money than the $5 million house but the speed at which you could sell the share of Apple will be much higher than the house. So that's one major definition of liquidity. That has nothing to do with what we are talking about today. So that traditional definition of liquidity, throw that out the window for this video so that you can understand a little bit of what we are talking about. Now, another definition of liquidity people that people like to use 
is the amount of money that's available in the system. So that can include deposits. So if you've heard of M2, this is a one of the definitions of money supply. It's the amount of deposits in the system that are issued by U.S. banks. That is a gauge of liquidity because people view the amount of money that's available to people as liquidity in that they can go use that money to buy things such as homes, assets such as stocks, Bitcoin, or consumer goods, which would increase the economy. Therefore, a large monetary base, the amount of liabilities in the system, M2 or deposits, all of these things refer to the same thing. People call that liquidity in that that's a pile of money that's ready to go to invest in other things, to buy other things. Now, we believe that that is also a valid definition of liquidity, but it's not quite what we are talking about either. What we focus on at the Bitcoin layer is asset side liquidity. That's different than the amount of money in the system. That's different than the quantity of deposits. That's different than the quantity of reserves or the quantity of cash that the Federal Reserve has printed. Asset-side liquidity refers to the amount of bonds, government bonds, that are held by central banks and banks. The reason that we look at the asset side of the banking system is because we understand that the asset side of the banking system is what can be leveraged to create money to buy financial assets. And so it's not necessarily different in its measurement from the liability side because, of course, assets and liabilities equal each other. So when we look at M2, for example, we're looking at liability side of banking system. That is going to pair off with the asset side of the banking system, of course, but the reason that we look at the asset side of the banking system is because we understand wholesale financing. Wholesale financing is a concept that refers to Banks funding themselves through the repo market because they have access to borrowing via their collateral, which is in the form of U.S. Treasury securities. So U.S. Treasury security and other government bond securities held by banks allows them to finance their activity through this wholesale market. So it's different than deposits. That's why we look at asset side, uh, an asset-based liquidity model because the liability side doesn't have the, this collateral ability to borrow against or to use that asset to create money in the system. So how do we do this? How do we measure asset-based liquidity? Well, we have a tremendous tool called MacroBond. It gives us hundreds of millions of data series, access to these data series. So what we do is we are compiling the U.S. banking system, both commercial banking and the Fed. We're looking at the European banking system, both on the private landscape and at the ECB. And we're looking at the Chinese banking system. We're aggregating these banking systems and we're looking at how easily are these banks able to create money. That's what it comes down to. Asset prices will go up and down based off of banks' ability to create money. Full stop. The reason that we have correlated the banking system with financial assets and risk assets, including stocks and Bitcoin, is because we've looked at the data, we've regressed it against the S&P 500, and we've come up with a model that gives us a 51% correlation. It tells us that not exactly, not perfectly, but we figured out what is moving asset prices. 
and it is a combination of essentially three things. The size of the banking system, the price of those assets that they hold, and the ability to turn those assets into money. So it's three components here that we are going to walk through with you and show you then how to look at global macro. Because if our goal is to understand what moves the price of Bitcoin, and that is our stated goal at the Bitcoin layer in our research with this quantitative report that we publish called Mean, Median, Mode every Monday, and with our ongoing research. We're trying to understand where are rates going? What, what is the Fed going to do? But why? Why do we do all those things? Because they all feed into our model. If you guys are familiar with Michael Howell's research at Cross Border Capital, he is the one that teaches an asset-based liquidity model. He is trying to explain, as we are, that the ability of banks to use their collateral, which is treasury securities, and use that collateral to create money. That is the source of liquidity for financial assets. That is the source of money. That is what will drive it up. It is also what drives it down when you have a lack of liquidity, meaning a lack of money creation from banks. And what would cause a lack of money creation from banks? High interest rates and uncertainty in the interest rate market that would prevent those banks from using the treasuries as collateral and borrowing against it or creating money against it. What would be another thing that dragged down liquidity then from that asset-based liquidity model? Less government bonds owned by banks. So more government bonds owned by banks is just a net creation of money in the system. It does come from nowhere because banks don't just use a pile of cash to buy their new treasury securities. They issue deposits on the other side as the treasury spends money into the system. When the treasury borrows and spends money, where does the money go? It goes to a government contractor. Where does that government contractor see the money? In their deposit account, in their checking account. And the checking account is a liability of what entity? We know it's an asset of that contractor. But in the banking system, it's a liability of the bank. What's on the asset side of that bank? They pair it off with a treasury, a brand new treasury security that was issued to pay the government contractor in the first place. So if you're interested in the T-charts, we have a perfect video for you to go through how money is created into the system via this process, via the repo process, via the government spending, borrowing and spending process. So understand how money is created. We'll provide you a link to that video here. But what we want to what we want you to understand about asset based liquid, liquidity is that it's a banking phenomenon it's a credit money system phenomenon so what moves bitcoin let's tie it all back once again what moves bitcoin money creation who does it banks and what influences it all these different global macroeconomic factors so in this chart, we show you our model TBL liquidity in purple, and we plot it against the S&P 500 tw trailing 12 months so that you can see the relationship here. Our index goes up, stocks go up. Our index goes down, stocks go down. And of course, it's not a perfect fit, but we do have a great correlation here. And we will explain what is inside this index and unpack it and teach it to you so that you can understand what moves Bitcoin, and you can understand what you're even looking for when it comes to global macro. The, your best bet is to subscribe to the Bitcoin layer here on YouTube. If you prefer audio, subscribe, rate, and review on your favorite audio platform, and subscribe at thebitcoinlayer.com slash subscribe to our free research publication. And if you want this report, 
mean, median, mode every Monday, you can become a TBL Pro. In this next chart, is we show you here the regression. So our index versus the stock market. You can see that positive slope. It sh that What that means is that as our index goes up, stocks go up. We have a cluster of data here over the last several years, and it shows us that we've figured out this relationship to a degree. We don't claim to have a crystal ball, and we definitely don't know where TBL liquidity, our own metric, is going to be tomorrow. That's a result of market activity, of banking activity. But it's our job here now to diagnose what's happening and to be able to explain then what's happening in risk markets. Our next chart here shows you the Bitcoin price on top and then on the middle and bottom panes, some rolling correlations versus the S&P 500. So going back to our index, if our TBL liquidity metric is supposed to have predictive power over the stock market, why do we care for Bitcoin? Because the statistical relationship is much noisier between Bitcoin and our metric. But because of this relationship with between stocks and Bitcoin and between TBL liquidity and stocks, we are able to confidently say that our index has an influence over stocks and Bitcoin, not just stocks by themselves. And the reason that we're able to do this is because we study the correlation of Bitcoin to stocks. So on the green line here in the middle, you have a 40-day rolling correlation. And on the red line at the bottom, you have a 100-day rolling correlation. What do these numbers mean? What we do is we take the daily return of the S&P 500 and the daily return of Bitcoin. And we compare those returns and over a 40-day period and a 100-day period. Now, the higher these numbers go, the stronger the relationship is between stocks and Bitcoin. Now, you can see that as of January or the late part of 2023, there was no correlation on a 40-day look back or a 100-day look back between stocks and Bitcoin. We think that that's fascinating and it's not rare. It's actually common that Bitcoin and stocks have periods of no relationship. It's also more common than not that they are moving together. So both things are true, that for periods of time, Bitcoin and stocks have no relationship, and for extended periods of time, Bitcoin and stocks have a very strong relationship. Both things are true, meaning that just because we figured out what's happening with global macro doesn't necessarily mean we are just going to have this crystal ball on Bitcoin. We're going to have a much better time managing the stock market because Bitcoin's relationship to the stock market can go away. Right now, though, you can see a strong relationship between Bitcoin and stocks. Really here as the correlation on a 100-day look back period is about 47%. So again, what does a high correlation between Bitcoin and the stock market really mean? It means that Bitcoin is more likely to react to global macro factors such as interest rates and the Fed. We'll take a break here from global macro to focus on Bitcoin's on-chain metrics. If you want a full understanding of Bitcoin's realized price and how to interpret Bitcoin's realized price, definitely go check out our educational video what is realized price. If you are already with us on realized price, you understand that it measures the cost basis of Bitcoin. Another way to think about it is the cold storage price of Bitcoin. What price did people pull it off the exchange and tuck it away into their wallets? That price is a measurement of Bitcoin on-chain activity and the dollar price at that time. Therefore, we can have a large divergence between the market price and the realized price as the market price is an exchange-based price. It's a live price. The realized price is a look-back aggregate price of where people took it off of exchanges. Therefore, 
The relationship between market price and realized price will tell us what? It measures profitability. Profitability is going to lead to a more likely scenario in which investors are selling. And low profitability, when the ratio is low here between these two, low profitability is not going to be conducive to a large wave of selling. In fact, every time Bitcoin's, Bitcoin falls back toward its realized price, we see support, meaning we see buyers come in. So, where is Bitcoin's price relative to its realized price? Only about 2x today. 1.9 here on the chart. Its realized price is around 32,000 and climbing. We view this as very healthy. It means Bitcoin really has a great deal of support above 30,000 now. We know that's a long way below where we are today on price. But the continual moving of coins off of exchanges into wallets that are cold storage. We don't know how long the investors are planning to keep them there, but the movement of coins off of exchanges into these wallets is a hoarding behavior that will exacerbate price move to the upside if Bitcoin can find momentum here. Remember though, that when this ratio gets to levels that are three, four, five, six, what that means is that people that put Bitcoin into cold storage are in an enormously profitable position. And what does that do behaviorally? It makes them more likely to sell and knock the price back down. So for those of you that are looking for signals on when Bitcoin is overheated, if you have hedging to do or if you want to sell and rotate into other asset classes in some sort of large, profitable scenario in which Bitcoin's market price is several multiples of its realized price, then you'd need to be paying attention to MVRV, market value to realized value, which is this ratio of market price to realized price. Look at it on a Z-score basis, which is normalized versus its history to give you a sense of historically where Bitcoin is overvalued or undervalued, or you can just use the raw ratio yourself and think in terms of if a, an investor took custody of Bitcoin at 30,000 and the price is at 150,000, a ratio of 5x, we are likely to see some of those investors sell. So is that, a, is that going to be a top signal for Bitcoin? If you're interested in these things, you should become a TBL Pro member so you're looking at weekly quantitative risk metrics alongside us. This next chart here is that Z-score I promised you. It looks, we have this chart looking back at Bitcoin and its whole hi history of market value to realize value. And what you see here is that that ratio Z-score is at about one and a half today. That's very far away from the overvalued ranges that Bitcoin trades at when it gets to its parabolic moves, when it gets to toppy price action, when you start to see Bitcoin on the headlines of the mainstream newspapers and of mainstream TV networks. That's when you know that Bitcoin has reached an overheated amount. And you can use the Z-score or you can use the CNN or the New York Times as your gauge for when we're overheated, they're probably all going to reflect the same thing. So if you see Bitcoin on the he on headline of CNN, as well as this Z-score reaching the overvalued range at the same time, that's double confirmation that you are in an overheated zone and Bitcoin's price will come back down. Why will it come back down? Because Bitcoin still has a contingent of buyers and sellers that are immature from a, it has nothing to do with the sophistication of the traders because obviously if you've held Bitcoin for a long time, you've made a smarter investment decision than most other investors. But I mean immaturity from the dispersion of the participants in the network. 
it's still more or less closely held Bitcoin as an asset class. There just aren't that many people that own Bitcoin. We might have 80 million Bitcoin owners. We might have 300 million Bitcoin owners, but we don't actually know the number and it's far less. The number of people that own Bitcoin is far less than the number of people that own other traditional financial assets, which will be in the billions. And so even if you have your money in a checking account, in a basic savings account, it is likely that you are participating in, at the very minimum, the treasury bill market or the repo market as your interest-bearing account has to invest in something to gain that interest. Somebody has to pay you that interest. All of those people around the world that have interest-bearing accounts or assets, financial assets, those people are influencing financial asset prices such as interest rates and stocks. That cohort of people is not influencing Bitcoin's price. So you don't have this you don't have this low volatility walk of Bitcoin's price. You have extreme violence. And while Bitcoin's extreme violence will get less extreme over the years, don't expect it to be uh, just mild behavior. It's still going to be extreme. Bitcoin, when it went down below 50,000 in late July, early August, it was a violent move. These moves don't happen to other asset classes. They just don't. And that is what I mean by immaturity. So it will, Bitcoin will cycle up and it will cycle back down. And if you are going to take advantage of volatility by trading around your position, you should understand the risk metrics that are driving it. For those of you that just want to hold through the cycles, you are being rewarded to do that as well. We also look at Bitcoin's short-term MVRV, so that's looking at the market price versus the realized price of short-term holders, so not all participants in the, net, in the network, but only participants that have moved coins 155 days or less. And so that gives us a really good understanding of the profitability of the more trader-minded people in Bitcoin. What price did they take money off the, did they take Bitcoin off the exchange and in the last 155 days? So that gives us a good, really short-term signal of where Bitcoin's price has a bias, either to the upside or to the downside. Now let's shift back to global macro. Let's talk about interest rates. Why do we care about interest rates? Bring it back to TBL liquidity. The size of the assets and the banking system, the price of the assets, and the volatility of those assets. So we are now moving on to this price of the assets. The price of treasuries is determined by the interest rate on treasuries. So interest rates and prices move inversely. So as interest rates go down, prices are going up. So when interest rates are falling, it means the collateral values of all of these banks are going up. That is extremely important to understand, okay? When we are talking about global macro influencing Bitcoin, by itself, treasury yields are going to give us a, only a tiny signal. However, the general direction of interest rates is going to have a very large influence on Bitcoin and the broader risk markets. But again, remember, not by itself. So when interest rates come down, that is going to be a net positive for Bitcoin. We That doesn't mean we're going to automatically see Bitcoin pop or stocks pop when rates go down, but it is a one of the guiding principles. 
and we do see that relationship strengthen and weaken at times. That's why we add in other factors, such as bond volatility, such as the size of the asset, of the banking asset, uh, whole system-wide balance sheet. And the reason that we look at interest rates is because we have to think about how interest rates are pricing in what's happening in the global macro economy, which will factor into what the Fed is going to do, which will factor into bond volatility. Now, of all the components, banking system size, banking system prices, treasury yields, and banking and the asset volatility, treasury volatility, volatility is the dominant mover. So of that 51% correlation, about 40% of it is due to volatility. So yes, we understand it's a new metric. We are trying to get it as close as we can to have predictive power over the S&P 500. But instead of trying to tweak the metric every week or every day, trying to get the fit closer and closer, instead, we want to explain it. We want you to understand it. We want you to understand why bond volatility is the main thing that we need to focus on rather than the Fed's QE necessarily. So in this table here, we have the different parts of the yield curve, twos, fives, tens, and thirties, and we're looking at the changes in yields over the last few weeks. We have a heat map to show us where yields are falling green or where they're rising in red. We can see very quickly with this color scale that yes, either rates are coming down or they're going up and understand what that's going to do to Bitcoin and risk markets. Remember, at the margin, higher rates will be restrictive for Bitcoin and lower rates will be good for it, but we can't just use one factor by itself. This next chart here, what this is showing you is the different points in the yield curve, twos, fives, tens, and thirties over the last 12 months. So vertically, you can see here that the two-year yield has traded between 3.5 and about 5.25. So that's the 12-month range, tw trailing one-year range, okay? The box here is the interquartile range. What, it me what that means is that's where twos have spent 50% of their time. So 50% of the daily closes for the last year were within this range. So between about four and a third and four and three quarters. The median value in black, of course, median is median. And then the latest value is this orange diamond. So you, what this tells us is that the orange diamond is below where the average close was, the average uh, closes were for the last year, the middle 50% of closes, and it's toward the bottom, but not quite at the bottom end of the range. This gives you an idea from, again, back to, for, to a liquidity standpoint. If the orange diamond is on top of the interquartile ranges, it means that, hey, rates are actually going up. That's not great for risk. It's not great for money creation. If rates are going up a lot, it increases uncertainty. And now we're getting to the meat of the product here, which is the move index. It measures bond volatility, treasury volatility. It's driven by certainty or uncertainty. So if an investor is uncertain on the path of interest rates, why would a, an investor be uncertain? Inflation, for example. If inflation is coming back, a bond investor doesn't want to own that bond. So it's going to pay for protection. It's going to buy a put. And that put costs money, and that money that is paid is reflected, the premium is reflected in the move index. The move index measures bond volatility. As it goes up, risk goes down. We have proved that to ourselves. We've included it with other factors to make our index, TBL liquidity, which includes interest rates themselves, and the size of the banking system itself, but what is the dominant factor? It's certainty versus uncertainty on what? On rates. Why? Because banks own treasuries. And what do they do? They wholesale finance those treasuries to create money. To do what? To buy assets or to lend 
to people that buy assets. So what is what are the secret drivers of Bitcoin's price? It is bond volatility, guys. It's bond vol. And what influences the certainty or uncertainty of interest rates and therefore bond volatility? The global macroeconomy, inflation, and the Fed. So that's why we Fed watch. That's why we eco watch. Because if inflation is coming back, people will want to sell bonds. The Fed is going to come back and hike. That's going to minimize money creation. Well, what's happening right now and heading into 2025? You tell me. Are rates going up or down? Their bias lower. Obviously, they've come down a lot already. What is happening to the size of the banking system? Right now, the Fed is still engaged in QT, but we believe that will come to an end. What's going to happen to the size of the fiscal deficit? Are we going to get more treasury bills issued next year that will expand the banking system? We believe yes. And so if we have a certainty on the path of interest rates, meaning we're not worried about them going up too much, that will be conducive to money creation and risk assets. So that's our broad and general base case for why we think that risk is going to do well going into next year. But like we said, what is going to influence the economy? The economy is going to be one of the main determinants. And interestingly enough, if the economy does really, really well, that will be not very conducive for risk assets. You would think that stocks would do great if the economy is booming. But if the economy is booming, the Fed will hike rates, not cut. And hiking rates will impact banks' ability to create money. It will, also, uh, it will also directly affect bond volatility as those that are long bonds will want to buy protection against higher interest rates. Because higher interest rates mean lower bond prices. Lower bond prices means less ability for banks to create money. So I keep bringing it back to TBL liquidity and the components so that you see why we watch rates, why we watch ECO, why we watch the Fed. This next chart is the term structure of interest rates. It shows you the shape of the yield curve. Right now, we are basically at uninverted, although we still see five-year yields at the lowest point of the curve. So that Inverted twos to fives curve still tells us the Fed is too restrictive. It's telling us that the path of policy rates going forward needs to be much lower from the two to five year standpoint. And that means the Fed is too restrictive today. It means that the Fed funds rate, even looking forward a couple years, guided by the Fed lower, is still too high. So twos, fives being inverted is important to us. It is a signal. It means the market doesn't think the Fed has gone far enough. Now, tie it back to T-bill liquidity. What will that do? More Fed cuts will increase certainty. Increase certainty, increase risk prices. And this table here measures the yield curve, 2s, 10s, and 5s, 30s, again, going back several weeks that you can see. Are we flattening? Are we steepening on the curve? In this next chart here, we have the Fed and its rate cut or hike expectations right now. Of course, we are in cut expectation. This dark gray line is your left y-axis, so that's giving you the forward rate implied by the futures market. We can see the downward sloping. The Fed funds rate will fall below 4% in early 2025. That's what this is telling you. The bars are your right side of the y-axis, the number of cuts priced in. So you can see that uh, in January of 2025, where the rate is right above 4%, that tracks to three cuts, right? Because we're at about four and three quarters now, three cuts will get us to four, and that's why you see the bars dip down to minus three there. So 
Why does this matter? Certainty versus uncertainty on interest rates. If the Fed is cutting, we will get more certainty. That is at, at the absolute core of our global macro take right now. Putting Bitcoin aside, just what we believe is going to happen in global macro, we believe the Fed is going to cut rates back down to 3.5% because 5.5% to 3.5% is just eliminating the restriction. So just getting back to neutral. We feel it might go even further, but our at least our bias is that that's where it is going. That will increase certainty, and we do believe that is the case. Now, when we have strong economic data, like we did recently, we, we, the reason we see interest rates go up is because bond investors sell bonds because they get less certain on the path of interest rates. That, oh my goodness, data is great. Maybe they won't be cutting. At the Bitcoin layer, we try to sift through the data and we look past individual readings and we interpret what the Fed is telling us. The Fed has told us they're getting back down below 4%. We are interpreting that. We're taking their word for it. And they will be executing on these cuts. It's why the debate around November isn't a 20... It's not a do we cut or not. It's how much do we cut. Because they are already telling you several months in advance what they are going to do. They are going to be cutting rates that will be supportive to liquidity. And the reason it's supportive to liquidity is because it's supportive to certainty, which will reduce bond volatility, which increases the power to create money. This next chart here looks at money markets. Money markets really matter because they influence the size of the Fed's balance sheet. They also influence the size of the commercial banking system. The commercial banking system is influenced by the green number, treasury bills. As the tre number of treasury bills goes up in the system, more money is in the system. The money markets are really influenced by the SOFR volume, which is in pur purple here, at above $2 trillion. Because the more repo that is needed in the system, it means that that inventory, that warehouse financing, that wholesale financing of treasuries that we talk about, that is a stress on the system because all of those funds take available funding away from somewhere else. And so scarce funds in the system will influence the Fed to grow the size of its balance sheet. I read an interesting analysis recently explaining how this reserve scarcity, it's going to happen in pockets, but the Fed has to play to the lowest common denominator. So if there's a small bank struggling with reserve availability, the Fed might have to address that system-wide, not just giving one bank access to reserves, but actually making sure that the next bank will have access and the next bank will have access. So we watch these components of the money market and we do so much more closely in mean, median mode every week with our weekly risk report. This next chart shows you repo rates. So the rate on those SOFR volumes in purple on the last chart is expressed by this orange rate. It, the orange rate is supposed to be within the Fed's window. And that's why we show you the Fed's window here. We show you the repo rates to see, hey, how is the financial plumbing going? Is it calm or not? If it's not, guess what? More balance sheet expansion will be due. So that's why we really watch this because the size of the Fed's balance sheet will influence. It will be one of the influences on Bitcoin, of course. And we are looking at the repo markets to tell us when the Fed might be going from QT, which is shrinking the balance sheet, to QE, which is increasing the balance sheet. This next table here looks at the economy. So we look at ISM manufacturing and ISM services. These are our favorite economic indicators because it allows us to strip away the noise. And what does it tell you? That the economy from a services perspective is doing above average and the manufacturing component of the economy is struggling. Labor is struggling across both ISM in uh, manufacturing and services, 
which, which you can see in this next table here on the labor market, which shows us the number of job openings, the number of hires, quits in the system, continuing jobless claims, and of course, ISM subcomponents on employment. Now, these ISM subcomponents being below 50, it basically means that both manufacturers and service providers are not hiring. And that leads us to believe that the Fed will be cutting rates, which again, increases certainty. We hope you guys learned a lot today from our overview on mean, median mode, the Bitcoin Layers weekly risk report. Make sure to subscribe to our channel and to our free research publication at thebitcoinlayer.com slash subscribe. We'll catch you guys next time.